circuit realization at faster time scales. And the craft program is, um, is older than the uh, 3D SOC uh, effort was. Uh, it has been going for a little over three years, and we have some great results to report today. And then you'll be sharing with one of the principal investigators from the program, Grusa Kalani of, of NVIDIA, and he'll talk, you about, talk to you about the great work that they did as part of this program. So the purpose for this program principally was, is to reduce the barriers to DOD use of custom integrated circuits built using leading edge CMOS. And this is my word for whatever you consider to be the latest manufacturing node, which I would argue at this point is 14 slash 16 nanometer, although pretty soon, as you heard earlier, it'll be seven nanometer. And to make sure that we can do that for the DOD, although fabrication costs are quite high, the major concern for DOD performers is actually the cost of design. As you look at design, it's very expensive. There are three main alternatives that uh, a DOD performer has to say, I'm going to build this system, I wanna build a microelectronics controller or some other function inside of the, this particular application. So you can use a CPU that you can program, you can use an FPGA, which is a programmable element, or you can design an ASIC. And there are two major uh, axes that you can see on this graph. One is the axis that describes what is the amount of time that it takes to actually do the design, and the other, and that's in blue, and the other is in orange, which is the power per function. Um, and if you look at the power per function, you can see that for a CPU, it's much higher. An FPG, it's lower, but of course the ASIC is much lower um, than that in its power dissipation, going from over a, a kilowatt down to less than five watts. However, simultaneously you can see the amount of effort that it takes, and actually I think this undersells how much effort it is. Writing the software, we know how to do that. People can do it relatively quickly. FPGAs are harder to design, but you can certainly do it. But doing an ASIC would take several years, and actually, unfortunately, this usually doesn't turn out how it is. We usually have to do another spin, and it takes even longer than this. So there's this trade-off of you can either have something that performs does the function at a very low power point, but it has to be at a lot of effort that it takes into the design. So the purpose for, one of the major purposes for the craft program was to make sure that we change that and that we actually reduce the amount of effort that it took to design an ASIC down to something more comparable to what you'd have for the CPU or the FPGA. So how have we done? It's been three years, how well have we done versus this goal of reducing by a factor of 10 the amount of effort it takes to do a, an ASIC? So we have metrics at DARPA, always do, and in this particular case, we'll show some achievements versus those metrics. So the first one was to reduce IC design time for a custom IC um, at the leading edge node by 10x. So what we did was we did these designs in uh, TSMC 16 FFC technology, and what we were able to show was a 11x to, I think the, the number is 8x, it's hard to read up here, 11x to 8x, certainly in the range of 10x, and in one case even overachieving, the amount of reduction in the effort that it took to do the design when compared with doing it using traditional methods. The second goal was to make sure that we could port designs Inside the DOD, we have time frames of 20 years or more for systems. Uh, those of you that work in the silicon industry know that that's so far out, I can't even think of what the world's going to be like in 20 years. And if any of you doubt that, just think back 20 years, and what did the IC industry look like, and what does it look like now, and they're very, very different. So we need a way to react to that. So what we did was we had a goal to reduce the amount of effort it takes to port a design, from one technology node to another by, by 5x. And our achievements were between 4.3 and 5.3x. We were able to demonstrate that by taking that same design and moving it over to another technology node, in this case, 14 LPP at Global Foundries. Another one was to provide access through technology to MPWs. While this may not be a big thing in the commercial industry, it's quite a big thing inside the DOD. We were able to make three success successful 16 nanometer MPW runs, and the last run is actually in fabrication right now. The design cycle just closed a few weeks ago. 
and those have come out with circuits that have been evaluated and tested. We've been able to demonstrate not just the design reduction in time, but also the quality um, as well as the results that came from those circuits. And the last item is that we were able to, uh, to establish a design repository. It doesn't do any good. A lot of this whole idea of the way that we save time and effort is by reuse. And that's great if we showed it in this program, but now we need to make it available to a wide variety of defense performers. And so we have a repository. It actually consists of something we call the vault, which is an IT infrastructure that allows all of these tools that were developed as a part of Craft to be avail available for defense contractors as they desire. The last slide is simply saying who is part of the program. You'll see uh, University of California Ber Berkeley. They utilize chisel and bag for digital and analog design uh, optimization. They basically, the concept is they use generators. For those of you that are familiar with memory compilers, it's a com compiler for logic, if you will. It's a representation that then can quickly be mapped into another one, another, uh, onto another technology, or for that matter, to have a little bit different uh, uh, specific specs for a given thing like a CERTES or like a RISC-V processor or a vector coprocessor. NVIDIA, and you'll hear more from Brusek in just a moment, uh, doing high-level synthesis for digital design and optimization, and then USC ISI that pulled together with Notre Dame the IP repository in the vault. So without further ado, I'll turn the time over to Brusek Kailani from NVIDIA, who will talk about their, their work on high-level synthesis. Brusek? Yep. Thanks, Linton. So I'm happy to share the results that our research group at NVIDIA has been working on uh, related to high productivity design methodologies. Um, and specifically, we uh, have been applying this to um, building machine learning accelerators. Um, so I'd first like to actually say that this work has been collaborative with Harvard uh, University um, with uh, David Brooks and Guyan Wee's group, as well as um, Mentor Graphics, who we've worked with on the high-level synthesis tools. So um, the, let me start by just motivating the, um, the same uh, design complexity or design cost problem that Linton talked about from a DOD perspective. From a commercial perspective, Moore's Law has been this double-edged sword. Uh, we've had, it's enabled an, um, an exponential increase in the um, number of transistors we can integrate on a single SOC, which has been great in terms of improving the capability that we can provide to end customers. But in order to meet the demands in the marketplace, we usually exploit all these transistors by adding lots of, um, by adding lots of uh, accelerator cores um, in, or, uh, uh, and so forth. So what I'm showing on the right is our latest Xavier SOC, which has a custom CPU, a custom GPU, and several image processing and deep learning accelerators. And if you sum all the time that's gone into building that, it's a thousand person team over many years, so 8,000 engineering years. And this is growing, so it's really untenable from a commercial perspective as well. If you look at how if you look at how, the, um, how this manifests itself in our, our ter typical development timelines, it, it typically takes about three to five years to go take an idea from, say, R&D into production. And um, you, know, you can think of the project as proceeding in phases, from an architecture phase to an implementation phase to a production phase, but it's really dominated by the implementation phase, which includes uh, manual coding of RTL, functional and performance verification of the uh, RTL, typically in system Verilog, as well as the VLSI implementation. Um, and that, that phase really dominates. And so the, the goal of this program is to see if we could, on the digital side, reduce that in terms of effort, in terms of engineering months, by a factor of 10. And if we could do that, it would allow us to do two things. First, it would allow us to overlap these architecture and implementation phases and get products to, mar to market um, faster and we could get more features into each SOC. So the research approach we've taken under the CRAFT program, which is uh, similar to what other performers have done, um, is to try two, um, two uh, um, major um, uh, research areas. So the first is to raise the hardware design level of abstraction. And the second is to employ agile design techniques borrowed from the uh, software world. On the hardware design level of abstraction, what we've 
decided to do is to ask the question, could we completely build a full SOC in C++ rather than using Verilog and use high-level synthesis tools or compilers to map C++ descriptions of our architecture down to synthesizable Verilog? And could we enable reuse through libraries and generators? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we were able to do that. We built a library we call Matchlib for doing that. On the right, the idea um, borrowed from software is to um, use agile design approaches. Um, so this um, implies having small teams that are jointly working on architecture implementation and VLSI together. So think of 10, 10 person teams working on those three concepts but for a single unit rather than having you know, hundreds of people working um, uh, on uh, RTL uh, verification in a bubble. Um, use continuous integration with automated tool flows and then have 24 hour spins from our C++ descriptions down to layout so we can do dozens of iterations during the march to tape out phase rather than just a few uh, trials through place and route tools. So the, the, um, the design abstraction approach we are using we call object-oriented HLS-based design. Um, what we did when we started the project is we knew that high-level synthesis tools existed. They were able to take C++ descriptions of untimed functions or signal processing kernels and map them to RTL, but they generally aren't used for the full, um, the, the full chip description. And we thought one of the reasons that this was uh, not the case is because you, if you try to use high-level synthesis tools, there's still a relatively high ramp-up time. You don't have a library like you have in C++ or Python or other languages in the software world that immediately allow you to be productive with the tools. So our goal was to go and create that library. And the analogy we like to think of is the standard template library or boost for doing hardware in C++. So we've developed this library we call Matchlib. It's available open source on our um, NV Research uh, GitHub page. It provides highly parameterized, high quality of result implementations of very commonly used functions uh, in hardware design um, that you can link with your C++ models and uh, push through high-level synthesis tools to get high quality of result implementations. On the right, once you use this library, you can basically include all these components in an architectural model and then do all of your verification through C++ simulation and check for functionality, check for performance, once you have a simulated C++ model that's been verified, from there downstream, it's mostly push button. So you push through the HLS tools to generate RTL, you go through logic synthesis to generate a netlist, and then through a standard backend flow for layout. Uh, if you're interested in the details, I encourage you to check out uh, the DAC paper here that we uh, published last year. <clears throat> the second side, once we've mapped our, um, once we map the design to a netlist, we uh, felt that there were a few things that were needed in order to enable this 24-hour spin agile design approach. The idea is every day we wanted to take our C++ model and go all the way down to layout for the full chip and then use maybe 60 tries of each day to tune our constraints and tune other things in the design as we're basically adding features together to, uh, to close on tape out. Uh, the first thing we had to do is, um, as many of you probably know, Typically, when you push like a one million gate uh, partition through a place and route tool, it takes many days or maybe even a week to do that today. So we had to split up the design into very small partitions, about 100,000 uh, standard cells or so. And that allowed us to basically run the place and route tools in about eight hours. Um, and that allowed us to do this sort of daily iteration through the place and route tools, always working on top of tree of RTL. Um, the second thing was related to time enclosure. So as most of you uh, probably know, it's challenging to close timing, especially in a 16 nanometer process. Uh, if I have to basically fan out uh, a, a clock with balanced insertion de delay to millions of flip-flops um, and basically close synchronous timing across dozens of corners, that's very challenging. It's much easier if I can instead just close timing as I'm doing placement and routing for a single block and then use correct by construction interfaces between our partitions. That's the approach that we have also um, used on Craft. We've used basically error-free clock domain crossings that are low latency and asynchronous between our partition using a globally asynchronous, locally synchronous clocking approach. That was recently published at Async, 
um, and receive the best paper award. Um, so we developed this flow, and the next thing we wanted to do is show that this doesn't work just on paper, but we could actually build real test chips and, and make this work. So the first test chip we did in, back in 2017, which was really just a driver to see if we could get the methodology work, was more of a programmable general purpose machine learning inference accelerator. You had a bunch of processing elements networked together using a network on chip. Um, and we, uh, this project took about uh, 20 engineering months for just the RTL and verification effort. The overall team was about eight to 10 people. Over the course of the year, we developed the methodology, architecture, R RTL verification of ELSI. And the next thing we showed is that we could take this design and easily port it to a different foundry. Linton talked about porting it to uh, Global Foundry's 14 nanometers. That only took five engineering months. Um, that was really a testament to the, the ease of porting um, the front end design process to a new technology and working with a design services vendor to easily um, show that we could uh, port the back end design uh, as well to a different technology. So now we felt pretty confident um, at this point in the program that um, the methodology was very productive. So the next question is, okay, how does it compare to the state, a state of the art um, SOC? And that's the third chip that we de uh, developed, which taped out in uh, June 2018. Um, it was just published at VLSI last month and will also be uh, announced at and published at Hot Chips. So this is basically taking the same flow, but a, a basically a brand new design that's targeted for um, convolutional neural network deep learning inference, and was uh, built in TSMC 16 nanometer FinFET. And the cool thing about this project is it went from freezing the architecture spec in December of 2018 to tape out in about six months with a team of about five to 10 people. It's basically one person coding the C++ model, one architect. The rest were kind of help a few people on verification, and most of the people are actually doing VLSI. Um, uh, and so this chip was, uh, not only did we demonstrate that we could use this very high productivity flow, but we also wanted to uh, play around with the concept that we've heard about during this conference of using chiplets to scale up. So um, each uh, chip is only a six square millimeter chip, and it has a high speed Surtees link uh, based off NVIDIA's ground reference signaling, te signaling technology that allows um, um, a very high speed link across organic substrate in a multi-chip module. So we're able to take 36 of these six square millimeter die um, and implement a hierarchical network where we have a network on chip and a network on package and achieve 128 teraops on 8-bit integer performance and nine teraops per watt. This is uh, bas basically very close to state-of-the-art numbers on deep learning inference. And this is all done with five to 10 researchers in six months. So this is... Um, a, a little bit more detail on the physical design. As I mentioned, there's, there you can see a picture of the package and, and the, whoops, looks like the auto advance might be on this. Uh, there you can see a picture of the package with 36 chips, uh, 16 processing elements. There's basically 100 gigabit per second of, um, of inter-chip bandwidth in our mesh. And one die can achieve four top tera ops, um, and 36 die scales up to 128 tera ops at its um, highest performing point. At its most energy efficient point, it can perform 0.11 picojoules per op or nine teraops per watt. And we're using this ground reference signaling technology between the chips that achieves 11 to 25 gigabit per second per pin at around a picojoule per bit. So we're pretty excited about this technology. Um, and to kind of summarize um, this, oops. To summarize, um, our experience was that by sort of tackling this problem when we first tackled, uh, addressed it three years ago, we wanted to ask the question, could design methodology, R&D, solve the design complexity problem? And we think that the answer is yes. And the key, um, the key things that we did were we raised the level of a design abstraction to design in a higher level language and rethink our design best practices for agile VLSI development. Uh, future work, and what we're actually what we're working on right now, is improving the maturity of the MatchLib library and um, sort of advocating of, for adoption of libraries within the high-level synthesis community. We also think that a lot of these ideas can be augmented with what, what are, was being explored in the IDEA program and other programs using, for example, GPU accelerated or machine learning assist, assisted EDA. So I'd like to acknowledge um, <clears throat> the, uh, the uh, DARPA and uh, Linton Salmon, who were the, was the program manager. 
Um, we had a number of collaborators who worked on this project at various times at NVIDIA. Um, as I mentioned, we've been collaborating with Harvard as well on this project uh, and have also had a number of former interns work on this. I'd also like to thank Mentor Graphics, who we worked very closely with on um, improving the HLS tool and targeting it towards our flow. Thank you very much.